Go ahead and keep this receipt. USC's 2023 recruiting class is better than Oregon's perceived Pac-12 number one recruiting class. You are Locked On Trojans, your daily podcast on the USC Trojans, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Fight on, everyone. I'm your host, Mark Culkin, and thank you for making Locked On USC your first listen every day. Whether you're watching on YouTube or wherever you'd like to download your podcast, we are free as always. And without you, the show means nothing. So if you are watching on YouTube and you haven't done it yet, there's that red subscribe button right about there. Do me a favor and hit it. It'll mean a whole heck of a lot. And to those, to all of you who already have, so very, very much a thank you. Well, again, without you, the show uh, doesn't mean anything. And I love your feedback, so you can always come at me at my Twitter, at Mark Culkin, M-A-R-C-K-U-L-K-I-N, or tell me how you feel on the uh, YouTube channel. This episode of Locked on USC is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. You can hire qualified candidates more efficiently by matching open roles with people who have the skills, values, and experiences to help you achieve your 2023 goals. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash college. Terms and conditions do apply. So if you want to know how a program is running, you're, you're going to check their, their recruiting rankings. It kind of gives you their temperature. The same application applies to USC fans. Take their temperature. If they're feeling a little hot under the collar, it's probably because Oregon might have taken another one or two uh, recruits that the fans wanted. And I think USC wanted as well, but the fans really wanted. There's always a uh, a ton of consternation about USC's football recruiting, Uh, especially whenever they lose a player to their soon-to-be former Pac-12 sister program, Oregon. Why? Why are fans always upset about this? I'll tell you why. Simply put, it's because when you're a fan, you're competing for that signature of a teenager. And it comes down to your personal pride, as well as, you know, you got to win that mythical recruiting national championship, right? I hope everybody's sensing my sarcasm. Uh, Look, if you listen to the fans, uh, Oregon's... You would think Oregon's football case, their trophy case, would be full of trophies and accolades. And players being drafted in the NFL by in the droves, right? <laughs> Flocking to the NFL. Not necessarily the case. We know the uh look, we know that those first two boxes that I just talked about uh, being checked, those are empty. That trophy case is pretty much empty, save for a uh a Heisman Trophy during the cheating Chip, Chip, Carroll, Chip Kelly era. But that's okay. They earned a Heisman. And we won't uh, we won't reflect back past that. But uh, if we actually peel back the layers a little bit further, USC is still developing and putting more players into the NFL uh, than their sisters from Eugene. And that's even during their, this, you know, what, people will consider a downtime uh, in USC's history, Clay Hilton era. And if if you're one of those who believe that Clay Hilton was a bust as USC's head coach, uh, his Trojans, his team's results on the field, they support that opinion. They underachieve. There's no doubt about that. Uh, But so despite, you know, that Rose Bowl season uh, and the victory that came along with it, I think it's pretty safe to say that Helton's teams definitely underachieved on the field. Now, I'll concede to the, uh, all those on-the-field results um, from his teams when he was the head coach. But, however, uh, when it comes to evaluating talent, he wasn't that bad. In fact, if we're going to use the NFL draft as one of the barometers 
uh, you know, to, to, to measure programs, health, you know, where they are with recruiting and developing their players. If we're looking back at the recruiting rankings, Oregon and USC show different results. The Ducks had the better classes on paper, right? But everybody's, everybody's looking for that. That number one, top five, top 10 recruiting class. There is a correlation that, you know, the better players you get, uh, the better team you're going to have. But you have to be able to develop those players. And you have to believe those rankings are legitimate, 100% accurate. We know they're very subjective. So on that note, we also know that USC is still having uh, more of its players drafted, uh, even with uh, Oregon winning those head-to-head -head recruiting battles. And even with the Trojans coming off a 4-8 and eight season, going into the 2022 NFL draft, Oregon still just had one player drafted. USC had three. And if we're looking ahead to the 2023 draft coming up this April, USC is positioned really well. They're probably going to have at least two first-round draft picks. Everybody's assuming Jordan Addison and Andrew Voorhees. Andrew Voorhees, uh, offensive lineman, comes from a position group, obviously, that some insist that USC just didn't. They insist that USC recruited poorly. And if you're comparing it to Alabama, Georgia, Ohio State, absolutely. But when you're going through the situation that USC was going through with their head coach at the time, you're trying to compete against those programs, but you're going head-to-head -head against programs in your conference that are trying to keep you down as well. So on that note, um, <laughs> what about Oregon's recruiting evaluators? And, and they're perceived top 10, you know, recruiting classes uh, that always send the same, send uh, USC fans into a tizzy. Heads are just spinning every time those rankings get released. Well, let's compare. And I'm just going to go back to 2015, All right? Clay Hilton was the head coach. Oregon was doing really well. Well, yeah, they're doing well compared to, you know, what, what some of us older people remember Oregon's program. Since 2015, and let's just be specific to the offensive line, because again, they've been out recruiting USC left and right, okay? Since 2015, Oregon's had six offensive linemen drafted. One of, just one of them was a first rounder, and that happened last year with Panay Sewell. Very good guy, very good offensive lineman. In that same time span, USC's had Five offensive linemen drafted. Two of them, first rounders. And as I mentioned, Andrew Voorhees is probably going to be another one this coming draft. So just like those previous classes, you know, no one's really going to know how this 2023 recruiting class success, uh, how it's going to pan out for a few more years. It's just, that's what, you know, I guess... Is USC winning football games, and are they putting players into the NFL? Are they developing the players they're recruiting? And if they are, um, you know, USC is just going to get better because they're actually now recruiting better players with Lincoln Riley. And that uh, that gap between USC and Oregon that everybody's so concerned about, it's going to grow. And we can forget about Oregon because now USC is going to be actually recruiting against Ohio State. In Michigan and the programs in the big, as well as all these uh, programs are leaving behind. <clears throat> um, so again, we'll, we'll know the success of this class in a, in a few years. Uh, some will develop, you know, some of these recruits, they're going to develop. Some are going to transfer. Others may have already peaked in high school. And, you know, you can't really just say, hey, it was the coach's fault for not taking them to a next level. There's a lot of players who peak in high school. <clears throat> so, again, if USC is putting more players in the NFL when they were perceived as being a down program, why are fans upset that their recruiting classes about, you know, their recruiting classes and their rankings? 
again, it comes down to perception versus reality. And I'm going to talk about that perception versus reality in our next segment. But first, let's talk about LinkedIn. Because as a small business, as a small business owner, or if you're a hiring manager, you know that success in 2023 all depends on the team members you surround yourself with. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. With LinkedIn Jobs, you can hire qualified candidates more efficiently by matching open roles with people who have the skills, values, and experiences to help you achieve your goals. LinkedIn Jobs help you quickly attract qualified candidates to your open jobs with targeting tools. They go beyond resume data, uh, data by using insights from your job post, company, and their 875 million member profiles to put your post in front of the most qualified candidates. They help you identify the most qualified uh, candidates on LinkedIn jobs and connect with them fast. And what's our favorite word around here? For free. LinkedIn jobs make it easy to screen and rate applicants based on your job qualifications all on one platform. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus the leading competitors. LinkedIn jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions will apply. Again, thank you for making Locked on USC your first listen every day. I need you to make sure you're checking out our brand new podcast, Locked on College Basketball. Everything you need to know about college basketball in one place. Plus, you're going to hear it from big name experts, insiders, coaches, and the players. Locked on College Basketball, available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcast. All right, look, I am guilty of this all the time. I allow my perception to dictate the actual reality of things. There are times, I again, I just I can't see the forest for the trees. I, I'll get just way too involved in the minutia rather than just looking at the situation as a whole. Big picture. I get it. it. It's really easy to fall into that, especially if you're a USC fan. It, it's really easy. Uh, you have your history, your tradition, and now you're allowed to use NIL and induce players. So, you know, that perception of NIL plus Los Angeles, big lights, you know, big, big city, bright lights, excuse me, uh, plus Lincoln Riley, all that was going to kind of instantly equate to the recruiting successes like uh, Pete Carroll was experiencing during his Halcyon days. But times 10, again, because of NIL. That was the perception. The reality is, look, we can call it cleaning up the house or, you know, just getting a lot of done, work done on a fixer-upper, but the point is Lincoln Riley has been cleaning up Woody and Harry. And he was doing that in less than a year. And remember, what we see, and not just the media, the bank, well, the media sees more than the most av average everyday fan. <clears throat> but what we see isn't always kind of front center at what the staff is focused on. <laughs> Uh, remember the the story I, I mentioned the tool that I told about Lincoln Riley's iPad and the 600 pages of notes he took when he got to USC. Well, so many thought he made enough home improvements in year one, you know, to to kind of change some of the recruits' uh, perceptions, and you know, as well as I don't know, maybe have the fans perceptions thinking that USC is going to have a top 10 recruiting class because they're coming off an 11-1 season and as well as a Heisman Trophy. The reality is on offense, Rick is recruiting top 10 class on offense, but not so much on defense. That's, you know, that's the, that's a perception. And to a certain extent, it's, it's a reality too. And people are going to back up that opinion based on when Oregon secured 
Mateo Ungalele's uh, December commitment, local stud, USC's backyard. It was, again, just another elite level recruit choosing Oregon over USC in recent times. Um, and this time, there was no Helton around to say, well, you know, Helton, he's long gone. Riley staff has been, had, had a full year to recruit USC's backyard. So when Roderick Pleasant picked up the Oregon hat last week on the February signing day uh, ceremony, I guess if you want to call it, it didn't feel very ceremonious, um, Trojan heads exploded again. And the perception was at this time now the blame Alex Rinch lost another defensive player. Again, can't blame Helton. You can blame, well, maybe there's some lingering effects, but no, this the, the crosshairs are strictly focused, lasered on Alex Rinch right now. Because people remember USC's defense last year, and they remember USC's offense and what kept them from most likely getting to the playoffs and beyond. But we digress. Here's the thing. You, the reality is you can't lose what you've never had. Just again, quick reminder for everybody who thinks that USC or Alex Grinch lost uh, Mateo and Robert, Robert Pleasant. The perception is that uh, USC didn't want, well, let's just focus on Pleasant. USC didn't recruit him that hard. Okay. Reminder, head coaches are only allowed one in-home visit per recruit. Lincoln Riley was there at the end of December. Okay. Alex Grinch and his position coach, Dante Williams, were in their home, the Pleasant home. It was either Saturday or Sunday, um, right before Monday's dead period, doing their in-home. So is USC losing the head-to-head -head battles for these players in their backyard because due to a lack of effort? Or are there other reasons? Uh, is Riley more focused on his type of player and the transfer portal to try and clean up any recruiting misses or messes? Pick or choose. <laughs> the perception kind of looks like that. He, he would prefer to use the transfer portal than use NIL to induce unproven, uh, highly rated high school prospects. Again, we can go over this. U, USC and Lincoln Riley, their, their vision of NIL and rewarding players is you, you need to earn it. And if you're going to spend the money, let's give it to players who have proven what they've done already in college. Look at Caleb Williams. Do you think he was worth $2 million or whatever that estimated value is when he came out of Gonzaga? Of course not. Took a couple of years and a Heisman, and now look at him. So that's what these high school players should be focused on, not pay me now and I'll play for you and I might leave you. Because that's the, that's the MO right now. It makes recruiting very difficult. And that's why, you know, if if money and NIL is too high on that priority list, they're probably not going to be real high on Lincoln Riley's priority list. It's a perception. It's also the reality. You just have to, there's that gray area. It's not a zero net, you know, net zero sum game. Here's the, you know, the recruiting reality is this, that even with the invention of NIL, USC's name brand and one of the top coaching minds in the country, money still matters, and so does perception. Uh, maybe the perception will get changed during spring camp when you're going to see more players transfer in and out of USC. We're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about that coming up because a lot of those 2023 recruits and transfers are going to be available in spring camp. 
and spring camp, I've got some news for you coming up in the next segment. First, though, if you're still looking for that delicious treat, and I'm kind of hungry right now, so uh, but you don't want all those fat and calories, then you got to go try a built bar. I wish I had one nearby. I don't. <clears throat> if you're like me, you want to eat healthier, but you don't want to compromise taste, and you've got then I've just got the right thing for you. You got to try built. With built, healthy is actually tasty. Seriously, they're so delicious you won't even think they're good for you. They're perfect for your New Year's resolution. You, what makes built bar so good is they've got their number one. They're they're really good, and they're made with 100% chocolate. And the flavors you can get them in churro, peanut butter brownie, coconut almond. <clears throat> and I'm not sure how they do it, but these built bars, they don't even taste like your everyday protein bar. They, they taste like a candy bar. They have four grams of sugar, only 130 calories, and they give you a whopping 17 grams of protein. And now you don't even need to wait around for your built bars. You don't have to order them online. You can go to Sam's, excuse me, <laughs> you could go to Walmart and pick them up at the pharmacy department, or you can head on over to Sam's Club and get a 13 box bar, a 13 bar box. Um, with their hit flavors of brownie batter and churro. Believe me, go get them yourself. Thank you later. All right, so I had mentioned on our previous episode of Locked on USC, I was under the impression that uh, spring break was going to start right after the students got back from spring break, uh, right around March 21st, 22nd, thereabouts. And then they were going to go straight through camp without a break, like, Lincoln did last year when he got here, when he took over the program. Instead, um, USC is going to be kicking off the, you know, as usual, spring camp, you get 15 practices. The first one is going to start March 4th, and the spring game, the Trojan Huddle, is April 15th. What's different about this year compared to last year is because they're starting a week earlier, they're going to be taking off a week during spring camp, like they did the year before Riley got here. Hmm. So as the current schedule has it, they're going to go every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. And then they're going to have that pause for a week between March 9th and the 21st for USC's student body spring break. Um, and we're still still waiting to find out the times for those practices. Uh, those haven't been announced, just the dates. But we do know the schedule, and we know that they're going to be taking a break in between uh, while they're in the middle, or after they've been involved in spring camp for a week. As I mentioned, that's a week earlier than they did last year. Um, and it, I guess it'll make sense because USC is starting their season a week earlier. With the zero week, they play San Jose State at the end of August as opposed to getting started in September. Uh, last year, they went straight through with their 15 practices. Camp started March 22nd, ended April 23rd. This year, it's ending April 15th. Eight-day difference. Which schedule do you like better? I know which one I like better. Um, I like the no-break camp method. You know, it's, it's just more of a discipline type of thing, keeping everyone's focus straight through don't give them that time to go out and party and have a good time and come back and have to kind of get back into shape i don't know i'm just that's my old school mentality uh i guess one of the early storylines is going to be the spring camp um is it going to feel different this year with caleb you know already resting his arm on a heisman trophy the other storylines we're going to look at, uh, obviously, the, the, all those defensive transfers that are coming in, as well as the defense in general. Plus, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing, hopefully, get to see the Branch brothers compete against each other, as well as other position battles. Um, there, look, there's plenty of time between now and spring that we're going to go over those plenty uh, before that uh, first day of spring camp. So we're going to transition real quick. We have to offer some congratulations to uh, Andy Anfield and the men's basketball program. First, Andy recorded win number 200 for him as USC's head coach. 
and that happened when the Trojans beat Washington at home Saturday, uh, 80 to 74. That 200th win, remember, this is his 10th season, so he's averaged it out 20 per. And when Andy took over the program, it wasn't as good as it is now. He's been building it up. And with that 200th win, he's still just fourth um, in USC's history. He's behind number one uh, coach Sam Barry, 260, Hall of Famer. Forrest uh, Twogood, 251. And Bob Boyd, 216. So at some point next year, actually, at some point this year, can Andy get there? We'll see. I don't know if USC is going to play 16 more games, but there's a chance. Uh, when USC beat Washington uh, Saturday night, USC, the Trojans, they improved to, that was their 12th win at home in a row, at home. So I keep harping on you fans. Get out there and support them. They're winning. It's fun. Check them out. They improved to 17 and 6 overall. They're 9 and 3 now in the conference play. There's still a game back of UCLA. And then this weekend, they well, Thursday, they start playing at guess who? That's right. Oregon. Keep them a theme. Thursday night. Saturday, um, they'll follow that up with Oregon State. This past Saturday in the win, Trey White and Kobe Johnson led the team. Each recorded a career high with 22 and 21 points, respectively. Keep in mind, Trey White, true freshman. Kobe Johnson, true sophomore. And Andy said that Kobe probably played the best full game of basketball of any Trojan he's coached during his time at USC. When you consider some of the players he's put into the NBA, that's high praise. USC also played that game Saturday night without Joshua Morgan and, and Reese Dixon Waters. Uh, Josh Morgan wearing the, the uh, walking boot. He's probably a couple weeks away. I don't know if he'll be available uh, on Thursday. And Reese Dixon Waters, apparently he had some lingering effects from what he got rolled up on. When I talked to him after the game uh, last week, he said he was all good. Just gonna throw this out there. He did get a technical in that game against uh, Washington State Thursday night. Did that have anything to do with it? I don't know. He didn't seem to be uh, moving gingerly when I saw him at the arena Saturday. So even without Morgan and without Reese Dixon, the team still was able to find a way to uh, to win. Trust me, and they shot blanks most of the night as a team. They were horrible in the field. But they hit the break, they hit the board. They were rebounding. They got a bunch of uh, off timely offensive putbacks, especially from Trey White. And they brought their defense as they always do at home. And that was enough to pull them through to get the win. Vince Uwachuku, he's coming along. Um, but without Morgan, Vince is still limited with his minutes. USC is going to have issues protecting the rim um, and protecting the paint. So this weekend, they just need to get through that that game up there with that ugly floor. And Oregon's got a big athletic guy. His name's uh, Nefali Dante. Just don't allow him to kind of go ham all over USC inside the paint. They should be able to handle that Oregon program. They're just they're only fourteen and ten this year. Uh, obviously, Pac-12 officiating. I mentioned that ugly floor that makes my eyes go not want to watch the game, but it is what it is. Apparently, that's not an advantage, but USC's curtain at home open is an advantage. You, Oregon's just 14-10 and 10 overall. Uh, they do have a win at home over Arizona, so they are a dangerous team to, you know, to, to keep an eye on. Right now, USC's basketball program, they're solidly in the NCAA tournament. And they do get Arizona at home, so that's another resume win, hopefully, <laughs> uh, that they can pad their, their schedule with. Um, so they just can't have any bad losses. And the goal is to stay in the top four in the Pac-12 and get that 
first round bye in the tournament. And I'll also get healthy. All right, that's this episode of Locked on USC. But once again, thank you for making this show your first listen every day. We just got done talking a little bit of college hoops. Go check out Locked on College Basketball again. Everything you need to know from all the experts, insiders, players, coaches. And it's for free on YouTube and wherever you get your podcast. All right, there it is. Locked on USC. First episode down for the week. We come at you five days a week. I also want you to head on over to WeRC.com. Got some good stuff going up for you over there. Some good written content. Eric McKinney, myself, Chris Arledge has his musings. Greg Katz has uh, his contributions and his humble opinion and his obvious, not so obvious. Go check it out. Well worth the subscription special we got going on. All right, everyone. Until the next episode, you know what to do.